Maybe some of you have done this. I don't know. I imagine one or two of you have done this kind of operation. Uh, I don't know. Let's find out. So long ago, uh, back when radios looked like this, um, you could kind of work on them because this was like in the 60s or 60s and 50s, but let's say 60s, um, just to be fair to me. And, and and these radios were actually somewhat repairable by by yourself because what you could do, um, you could repair some of the parts by replacing them. So you look at the back of this radio, it has seven tubes. Now a tube is like a transistor. Now I don't know if many of you know what that is. In the UK and India and, and the rest of the English speaking world, they're also called valves. So you might know them as valves as well. So a tube radio had, this one has seven, seven tubes, which is equivalent to seven transistors. You know, my iPhone here, my iPhone may have, it could have, you know, 900,000 transistors in here. I don't know. But this, this had seven. You can, you can take it to the shop. So what you do is you go down to, you find a bad tube, you think, I used to play around with electricity and I used to fix things. And so I thought, this, this tube is probably weak because it's not doing this and this and this. So you take it to, you take it to a place called Radio Shack, which is your electronic supplier, or to a 7-Eleven, which is like your local, your nearby market. And they have these things called tube testers. And anybody could go in there, you bring in the little tube, you pop it in the tube tester, and it would show, as you can see, maybe you can see the meter on the top of it, it says bad or good. So when, as it turns out, Radio Shack used to offer lifetime warranties on all their tubes. You could buy, buy all your tubes at Radio Shack. Because when you take it to the tester, if it shows bad, you return it. What happens is you'd go to Radio Shack, you put the tube in, you knew the tube was bad, but it would show good. You tell the guy, this tube is bad, he'd say, I'm sorry, sir, it's showing good. You go, but this tube is bad. But I'm sorry, sir, it's showing good. So what, what do you do? Take things into your own hands. You devise a little contraption. This is a this is a tube, one on the left. That's what they look like. Sometimes they're glass. Sometimes they're glass encased in metal. So you'll see metal a metal tube, but it actually has glass inside. And they have a filament inside. This little heater, which usually runs on six volts or twelve volts. And so the only thing you could do to make it effective easily is you'd attach a little more power than it's used to, maybe 50, 60, 70 volts. And this thing would, would blow for a little bit. It would blow. And voila, your warranty, your lifetime warranty is now valid. <laughs> so you actually have to break it a little bit more than it was broken in order to get a replacement. And I don't know if you've done that. <laughs> they think that this technique is the last straw, but it, and it works. So let's talk about the, the first term that we introduced and why it's important. So the first concept that we want to talk about that's, that uh, helps us buy, decide, and keep products is, is a concept called flow. So what is flow? Flow is a smooth, uh, transition of steps from one step to the next step to the next step. And in, in the cases that I'm talking about, the steps are either, the immediate steps are obvious. The steps, 20 steps from now may not be obvious, but the, but the progression of steps is obvious and it makes you feel good. Um, so three characteristics of the flow. It's the smooth progression of steps. It's the intrinsic enjoyment brought about by the optimal user experience. So a fantastic user experience probably has nice flow from step to step. And the last one is just kind of like the mental zen that you get into when you're, when you're doing something and you're fully immersed in it and it just feels like I'm one with the product. You know, this is fantastic. And we'll show some examples of these three uh, characteristics of flow. So the flow in a river, everybody understands that rivers flow and that's where this term comes from. And sometimes rivers have, like in, a, in, in England, they have uh, canal boats you can take tours on. These used to be for industry, but now it's a tourist thing where you can rent a canal boat for three days or a week and go down the river. You follow the flow. But what you notice also, as part of the flow, there are transitional elements. You go through gates. And these transitional elements take you from one level to the next in a smooth way. And it's kind of fun. You have to get out of the boat, move, you know, open the gate, close the gate. You do it all yourself as you move down the river. But you follow the flow of the river. And the 
Gates are part of the experience. Uh, you think, why is Alan qualified to talk about the flow? Well, I have a Helmsman license. I am certified. I took a one-day course in navigating a long boat. So I'm, I see here's my certificate, so I am qualified to talk about the flow. I needed to show my credentials. Okay, um, so what does the flow have to do with what, what we do here? Well, let's look at a, a phone call in the 1900s. In, in the 1900s, when you placed a phone call, you had your little phone, your, you called Mabel and said, hello, Mabel, yeah. uh, could you connect me with, uh, with uh, Arthur, please? Yes, one moment, please, let me connect you. She did some switching on the, on, the, on the panel, connect you with the other party, and voila, you're connected to the other party. The thing is, you were aware what Mabel had to do. He says, let me connect you, let me switch you, let me route you to the other person. So you were aware of the back-end equipment. There wasn't much back-end equipment, but you knew that somebody had to, had to connect you to get, a, to get into a call. In the 1970s, a phone call was a little more sophisticated where you had a 5 ESS switch, an at t switch or a Siemens switch between you and the call party. And so, except for maybe long distance calls, we have to say, operator, can you connect me long distance to New York, please? Or most of the time, you weren't aware of the back end equipment anymore. You, you could just push the, you just dial the buttons and you were connected. In 2003, it's a bit more sophisticated. You now have cell phones, cell phone towers that connect to switches in the switching, in the uh, phone company and to someone's home phone. But all this is transparent because now when you dial a phone call, you're, you're, you're kind of dizzy when you're dialing the numbers because all you're interested in is, what am I going to say to this person next? I have no consciousness about, let's see, I need to connect to a cell phone tower. I'm driving really fast, so I may be hopping cell phone towers. They'll connect to a 5 ESS switch. We'll connect to the center and then back to the home. You don't think about that. You just think about the conversation you're going to have with the person because the, the the equipment in the middle is transparent. Of course, in 2009, it's even more sophisticated because now you can, uh, you're, you're not aware at all, and you can do other things besides make phone calls with, with these new fancy phones. Unless you don't know the number anymore, you push a guy's name and say, connect to him. Right. So you you don't even care about the number anymore. Exactly. Yeah. You can push a guy's name and, and call by name. You don't even need to know the number, so it's even more transparent. And sometimes there are actually applications on this type of phone where you have a picture of the person, you just push the picture of the person and you're in. So you, it's very transparent. You don't know what's happening. So we said that the flow was the intrinsic enjoyment brought about by the optimal user experience. So let's look at an example. Here's a random person downtown thinking, gee, I'm hungry. What am I hungry for? So I pull out my phone and I say, well, let me look up Let's see where I am now. So I push a button and it says, oh, you are here. What am I hungry for? I'm hungry for, I'm hungry for Italian food. Let's find out where. Ah, where's the, the, the phone automatically tells me the nearest Italian food place. That looks like a good place. Bellagio's restaurant. Where is it? What's its phone number? So I continue pressing buttons. I follow the flow that the phone gives me. And I'm, I'm now being presented with the phone number, the website, the address. So I could choose to look at the website, find out what time are they open, what's their menu like. I could call them and say, are you open? I'd like to make a reservation. And then I can find out, well, I'm here. How do I get there from here? So the phone, the flow that I would do normally by, by taking out a map and, and looking where I am and finding a restaurant in the yellow pages in the, in the phone book, and doing all these things is now presented to me in a smooth flow exactly as how I would think about it normally. So that's finesse. If you have one of these, it's fantastic. Um, okay. In the 1970s, in offices, the workflow was more like this. So you had a program <laughs> called BusyCalc. Anybody remember BusyCalc? One, two. Okay, BusyCalc was a spreadsheet. Then you had another program called WordStar. And that was your Microsoft Word. But WordStar was, that's where you get the control C, control V. If you didn't know that, control V, paste, it comes from all the way back from the 
from the 70s. And, uh, you always wonder, control C makes sense, but it's that, that's copy, but I don't know where the V comes from. And then, yeah, it's close to the C. It's close to the C. It's all four of them, they're close together. Okay, all the keys are close together. And, and then they have this uh, portable laptop which weighed about 40, 50 pounds called the Osborne. And you had your overhead projector and your calculator. But, but these things didn't talk to each other. So if I wanted to take some information from my spreadsheet to my word processor, I'd actually have to almost print it out because you couldn't run these programs concurrently. I'd have to print it out and then retype in my information. It's quite a hassle. But in today's world, it's quite different. Uh, we have, um, I guess, in around 2000, or you know, when Microsoft first started out with their Office Suite, you could paste. You, you had PowerPoint, Excel, and Word. You can actually paste things back and forth from all these applications. Well, in 2009, you can do all this stuff, but in the air, in the cloud. You don't even have to have the applications locally, where you have uh, Google Docs and spreadsheets, or Adobe has a product, or uh, Microsoft Office Live, or Zoho Writer. All these applications now don't even reside on your computer and you can do all these things and they all integrate nicely. Uh, each of these suites integrates nicely with the components within the suites. So, so the flow is a lot nicer between applications. The flow for Polycom video conferencing in 2009 looks something like this. And you have a very nice, fantastic media card. We make very beautiful cards with uh, nice features. We also make wonderful endpoints such as the 4000. However, in today's world, in 2009, a lot of the times you have to be aware of the back-end equipment, of the infrastructure. So I want to call I want to call somebody outside of Polycom. What gateway number do I use? Am I registered to the gatekeeper? Are they in my address book? Do I need to use internal IP or external IP? Is this NAT traversal? Uh, but what is an RMX, a CDA, a CMA, CDA, RSX, RSS? But I want to make a recording. I have to know that you need to call the RSS first, Alan. What's an RSS? Oh, it's just this thing. So you call the RSS and you go through some gyrations and you can make a recording. But you have to be aware of the back end equipment or a lot of the time. Not all the time, because some of the stuff that we do internally is smooth, but much of the time you have to know about gatekeepers, gateways, and, and, and RMXs, RSSs. Do I have enough capacity on my internal MCU? What's an MCU? I don't know. So if you look at Polycom in 2009, it's kind of like the phone company in the 1930s, where you were aware of the back end equipment. Again, we make beautiful endpoints and beautiful hardware for all these components. but they're not playing well together. So, let's go back to the flow. Okay, the other part of the, the other facet of flow is the mental state in which the person is fully immersed in what he or she is doing by a feeling of energized focus. And again, I'm going to talk about the U.S. for some of you who don't live here, but but we have the, I guess all governments collect taxes. In the U.S., you have the Internal Revenue Service called the IRS. The IRS makes this, fill out this multitude of forms every year to pay taxes. And this is how we do it. The form looks like this. It looks very easy to fill out at first sight. Uh, quite simple, not, uh, but what's interesting is the flow. So when you start filling this out, the flow looks something like that. I mean, you, to the point of, after you get past the first section, there are so many references to other things on the form in other places and so many references to other pages elsewhere that you're totally lost. So I just took the top part of this form and I drew arrows every time there was a reference to another form somewhere else. So you can't even get past you know, the, the first quarter of the, of, the, of the form without having to reference something else. So the flow is absolutely horrible. You don't know where to go. You have to have you know, a gigantic table to lay out all your forms and it's a very complicated affair. You also have to be a programmer because they use if-then-else statements in the tax form. So about the yellow lines up there are if-then statements. Let me read one to you and see if you can understand it. Ready? Okay, this is on line 42. It says, if line 38 is over $119,975 or 
you provided housing to a Midwestern displaced individual, see page 36. <laughs> Otherwise, else, multiply 3,500 by the total number of exemptions claimed on line 6D. What does that mean? Absolutely nothing. I mean, there's, there is no floor audit. It doesn't make sense. It means audit. audit. <laughs> it means audit. Present. Yes. <laughs> So, 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 th so this borders on, on the ridiculous, and, and and there's a guy here in Austin who loves to untangle fishing line. He happens to be sitting in this room over there. He's laughing, but he loves to untangle fishing lines. And that's what this is like: a big mess of fishing line or a, a massive bowl of spaghetti. That, that's what the, that's what the RS forms look like when you try to do it themselves. So, to the rescue, I mean, there's a company who thought, ah, opportunity knocks. I mean, everybody. You know, there's 300 million people living in the United States. Let's let's do something with this. So they took the opportunity to make it simpler for you. So there's a product called TurboTax by a company called Intuit, and they take the massive disorganization and spaghetti of these tax forms and turn it into a palatable, uh, usable flow. We actually like doing your taxes, or maybe like doing them a little bit better, especially if you get some back. So here's some examples of TurboTax. So first thing it tells you, it starts out by telling, by giving you expectations. What's going to happen when I do this? Well, I'm going to be rewarded by getting a bigger refund, because they're going to tell me all of these things which I don't know, and forms that I have to fill out that I didn't know there were forms for. Uh, it's going to tell you how to file electronically, and it may protect you from an audit. And as it turned out, it turns out, there was an individual here in the previous session where TurboTax helped, they got audited and her, TurboTax helped them out of that audit somehow. So, so you have expectations set. Then, the flow of the forms is quite easy. They speak, first, they speak to you in plain English. They ask you about, for example, uh, your family. I had children or other dependents. I had no children or other dependents. I adopted a child, I, I financially supported the relative. And you just check, check the one that applies. So the flow in TurboTax looks something like this. From top to bottom, left to right, just check what applies and go forward. And all the pages are like this. They're all easy like this. this is, I didn't particularly pick an easy page. It's all just talks to you normally and just glides you through. And if you want to take a break, you can take a break and you can come back. It will take you to exactly where you left off. Uh, it also applies finesse in searching for tax deductions that you didn't know you had and giving you options about uh, for audit and audit support. And at the end, again, it's a flow, it's step by step, step one, step two, step three, step four. The IRS forms that the U.S. government gives you are nothing like this if you're not used to filling out uh, U.S. taxes. <coughs> This is the company mission. If you look at the, this company's mission into it, uh, their mission is to change lives so profoundly people can't imagine going back the old way. There's, and if you ask anyone who's ever used TurboTax, I don't know anyone that would ever go back. Do you? Anyone here ever use TurboTax? And anyone go back? <laughs> I don't think you can find a person that would not use this tax preparation program. Because what the what you get from the from the IRS is absolutely ridiculous. No, it doesn't make any sense. So this company is capitalized on just the flow. They use the flow and finesse, and they're making money on it. The next, so part of part of the flow is transition. So you saw the the locks on the canal. That's a transition from one state to the next state to the next state. And transitions help provide clarity. Transitions establish connections between sections. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of transitions in different parts of my life. So in architecture, if you're an architect, you, you probably know this about this, but in architect, they have a, a, um, a feature called a pendentive. And that is that, I'll, I'll, it, that triangular structure that you see on the example on the right. It's a pendentive. And if you're designing, say, a church or a building with a dome that now has to interface to a square box where the floor is, how do you interface the two together? How do you put a round object on top of a square surface? 
Well, these features, the pendensives is a transitional element that looks that makes it look nice and smooth. Here's here's a uh, photograph of a church in the Czech Republic where one is used, and you've seen these hundreds of times in in, in many places. Grand Central Station in New York has has these if you've been there, where the where they have arches, and um, so that's a transitional element that makes the flow of the architecture smooth. And in this very building. You see downstairs a transition between granite and drywall. So you see a, a stone surface interfacing with a white surface. But what you notice is your eyes don't focus on the large areas. They only they generally focus on the transitional elements. So you'll, you'll, your eyes will follow the lines and surfaces where edges meet. Not and and you'll totally ignore, your brain will totally ignore the large surfaces. So transitions help you uh, move from one surface to the next. Now, this is a horrible transistor element here. This is an example of, of a parking garage uh, near where I'm standing, where the lines don't meet nicely. You have all kinds of objects sticking out. And you don't know where to go, but it looks like a mess. Uh, and you're not sure this structure will hold up uh, because it looks stapled together. But your eyes go to the transitional elements, which are, uh, which are lines that are uh, jagged and uneven and uh, well it's, just, it's not nice compared to what you saw earlier and there are also trans transitional elements on on a lawn where the grass meets the, the concrete uh, okay and uh, transitions are also found in language where uh, you know about if you've studied poetry then there are transitional elements between verses to make the, the whole thing glue together nicely in paragraphs um, in, in a um, in in word-based transitions, there are three steps. The three steps are: I've got uh, I've got two ideas. I've got idea number one, idea number two, and I want to get from these two ideas. I want to merge them together somehow, and you merge them together by applying a transitional a transitional element in between. So here's an example of. Uh, <clears throat> the the uh, the two outside boxes show the two statements. So the two statements are Martin Luther King preferred to do things legally if possible. Martin Luther King also suggested that breaking unjust laws may be just. So how do you coincide these two together? By a transitional element in the middle, right, where the the paragraph becomes, if they were an exception to Dr. King's rule of nonviolence and law abidance. It would come when members of the community determine a law to be unjust. And that sort of ties the two statements together with the transitional elements. And the reason we're saying we're talking about transitions because it's important in design and uh, user experience and in user interfaces and going from one place to the next. Here's an example of uh, a user interface transition. Now, you've seen the fancy, you've seen fancy user interface transitions like in a say in a TiVo box or in um, Apple TV or in in iChat where things fly and are nice. But you can also do something, some simple, um, you can apply simple engineering and, and achieve good results. Here's here's an example of, of the, uh, the next release of HDX uh, user interface. I'll, I'll show you two screens without a transition and then the same two screens with the transition. So here is screen one where I'm going to uh, select uh, my contacts. Screen two, the transition between going back and forth looks like this. There's no transition. So it's a little bit jarring. Now if you apply a simple crossfade to these same two elements, it looks like this. Sorry. And just just fading them, just simply fading one to the other, uh, changes the perception of the UI as being smoother, easier to use instead of the harsh transition. This is a simple application. There are many many transitions that we can apply to make our equipment look friendlier. Okay. Uh, the the uh, the other aspect that we talked about earlier of, of product selection or or um, or criteria for keeping products is, is called finesse. And we'll define finesse 
refinement and delicacy of performance, execution, or artisanship. That means excruciating attention to detail. Now, um, well, it's easier to show by example what I mean here. I'm going to show you a, a, a product by Apple called the MacBook Pro, which is um, has, a, has an aluminum body. Maybe a lot of you have seen this. Looks like this. I'll show you some some features of the MacBook Pro that that, that I I think are are showing finesse. So, if I I have a Lenovo computer here that I'm using, but if I accidentally run into the power cord, running along, in it, oops, what happens? Well, the, the PC gets knocked down because the power cord yanks it on the floor. If I do the same thing to the, to the power cord of my MacBook Pro, it has a magnetic connector. When I kick the cord, nothing happens. Uh, the other day we had we had guests at our house, and they brought their guest dog, which was part bulldog, part Rottweiler or something. But this dog, my wife had her MacBook Pro running, the cord was running across the living room. This dog bolts through the living room, runs through, knocks the cord off, nothing happened to the laptop. That's finesse. Okay, this is my Lenovo computer in the dark. That's what you see. It's a picture taken all, only with, with no room light. But the Lenovo has a nice feature, and those of you who have the IBM ThinkPad or Lenovo's, if you hit function, top right hand key, there's a little light that lights up and lights up the keyboard. That's very nice. However, what's nicer, this is the LED, sorry. What's nicer on a uh, MacBook Pro, here's a Mac in the dark. What you find is, uh, is that as the lights go down, uh, the keyboard lights up and the, the screen dims so that you can see your keyboard in the dark and you can continue typing. And this is more clever than you know. It's so clever that if you cover up with your hand, if you cover up one side of the PC where you think the sensor is, nothing happens. If you cover up the other side of the PC where you think the sensor is, nothing happens. You have to cover both sides of the PC with two hands so that it assumes that the room is actually getting darker and you're not accidentally putting your arm in the way of the sensor. And then it dims and then it responds to the light. That's finesse. Somebody took the extra time to think, hmm, maybe I should, maybe we should do this. Um, okay, the Dell screen lights. I've got a Dell computer right here and it's got this sharp latch that's going to you know, run into me every time. And, I, and you always have to look at it, it's always showing. If I look at it on a MacBook Pro, there's no latch. Well, actually there is a latch on the MacBook Pro. But it only shows up when the lid is closed down to the last millimeter. When the last millimeter comes up, the little hook comes out. As soon as you open it up, the hook disappears. You don't see the hook. It's a small thing that's finesse. That's why the display looks smooth and clean. Okay, on a Lenovo uh, computer, you look at the battery, you pull it out, there's no indication of the battery level. However, you could have put it back in and see the battery level on the display. Oh, but you can't because the battery is out, so the display is not working, so you can't tell the battery level. So you don't know what's, what's up with the battery. On a Dell computer, you can pull the battery out, look at it, push a button, and then you can tell the level the battery level on a Dell computer. Of course, on a, uh, on a Mac, you can just flip it upside down, push the button, and you can tell the battery level without even turning it on. Now, Dell has actually copied this right now. So the new Dells now come with a battery indicator, so you can't see the uh, indication. Uh, this is a real simple thing, but it's very helpful. On a Mac, the power connector has a little light on it, and the light when the light's turned on, you know it's charging. When it's orange, it's charging. When it's green, it's charged. So you instantly know the condition of your battery without opening it up, trying to figure out what's the condition of my battery. And it also tells you if it's plugged in. Do I have it plugged in? Did I knock the cord out? What's happening? Or is my power strip turned off? It's a small thing, but it's finesse. Okay, the, um, the power supply lets you use either a long cord or a short cord. They just snap in and snap out. All the, all the Mac products do that. Now you may think, well, Alan's a Mac bigot, he just likes Macs, and he's just showing what the Macs are. But 
But the Macs actually make mistakes. Apple does make mistakes. So on a LAN, this is so stupid. On a, on the LAN connector of an Apple MacBook Pro, when you plug it in, there's no indication that you have LAN activity. Now every other product that you know about shows you LAN activity. The light blinks, right? But on a Mac, it doesn't blink. It doesn't show you that, which is which is silly. For all these other good things they put in, they left that out. And of course, on your on your the LAN status of a Lenovo or or any computer is always present. You can see, well, it's plugged in, I can tell. Now, there's room for improvements for us at Polycom. I mean, if you, the, the first thing that comes to mind is when I plug in my content into my PC, which I've done here, why isn't there a little light on, my, on the plug of, of the content where I can see, oh, you have content, it's turned on. And it's very simple, you know, it's a simple thing to do, but we could do that and add a little finesse to what we do because everyone knows here, it's very difficult to get your PC all F7, F8, F9, you know, preferences, uh, etc., just to get the thing to display. So, okay. The, in the next section, we'll talk. We'll show you some interviews of some people and the products that they love. I would have to say uh, my most recent, most delightful investment has been my. Uh, I picked up a pair of Vibram Five Finger shoes. They actually have a cuts in for each of the individual toes, so it's a hiking sole, but then you, it's supposed to help strengthen your metatarsals when you run, help fix your posture, and help increase proprioception, which is your awareness of different areas of your body and the location of one another in your area in the environment. So. And did you get the matching socks? I did. Yeah. Excellent. I did, the With the socks. Yes, yeah, so I love them. Perfect. <laughs> Very good. So, a little pricier than normal, but... So it's pricier than normal? I'd say so. As but far you, as what I'm willing to pay for shoes. But you don't mind paying for no. them? No. Absolutely. And I'm completely worth it every okay. time. Uh, my favorite thing for probably the past two years now has been my Toyota Prius. Okay, and what about it do you love? Uh, well, the obvious answer is that I get 45 miles per gallon. But um, I, my favorite feature, which I never thought I needed, but now I don't think I can live without, is the key. This one, it just has to be in proximity of the vehicle to unlock the vehicle. And when, when it's in the car, you can, the d car can drive. In other words, you don't have to get it out of your pocket or your purse to either get in the vehicle or drive the vehicle, as long as the key is on you. So how do you open the door? You just walk up and put your hand on the handle. You walk up and put your hand on the handle yeah, without hand taking on. it out of your purse. Correct. And that's what you love about it. I know. With the, it's fantastic. With the Do you think if they so had Toyota come and asked you about it, would you have invented that, or how did? Oh no, I didn't even know it came with it. It was just like a pleasant surprise. And I, my favorite <laughs> object is it's a wine opener that it's basically a one pump deal. There's no cork screw. There's no cork bits. You clamp it around the wine, you pump it once, the label is cut, the cork comes out, and it's like one action, it's, you can be the perfect host because it's so smooth, simple action, simple mechanism, and it's like I'm pumping wine from the ground, which I, I love. Um, my KitchenAid Immersion Blender. And what about it do you love? It will chop, puree, um, blend anything you need, and you can make it into, it has an attachment, so it can be a food processor, or you can do it in a pot, or you can uh, turn it into, what else, oh, a whisk as well, so it comes with everything, and basically it's like an all-inclusive kitchen tool. Is it about the same price as a, a normal one, or is it? Um, I would say it might be a little bit more expensive, but with all the attachments, it comes equal to what you would do if you were to buy each thing separately. And you're willing to pay for the price? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Really? It's no problem. Yeah, and it's really not that much more expensive than regular ones. And you'd recommend it to your friends? Yes, oh, definitely. Excellent. The most to you. Festool saw. What is a Festool saw? It's a uh, saw for cutting wood. And, and, and what's so great about it? Precision. And do most people who have that saw love it? Yes, I think so. Is it uh, average price or? No, it's expensive. Is it like a DeWalt? A rigid, Milwaukee. Yeah, twice as much. Probably. Twice as much. Yeah, but you love it. That's what counts. It's a good investment. I love my new Fisher Paykel dis dish drawer dishwasher. <laughs> uh, can you say that again? Is that that sounds like a tongue twister? Fisher Paykel dish drawer dishwasher. And what exactly is that? I have no idea what it's that is. It's a dishwasher with two separate drawers that you can run separately. And what's so unique about it? What's so? What's why do you love it? 
because you can fill up one and run it and continue to fill up the other one as you use dishes. You're kidding. And run them separately. And each one can wash pots and pans and or anything? Or is um, it? It's on the smaller side. It's a Euro uh -huh. style dishwasher. And did you pay average price more or less than a comparable dishwasher? More. more. And Slightly did, more. Was that a problem for you? No. Because? Because we knew we wanted the dish drawers uh -huh. that we could put our own fronts on cool. to match the cabinets. So, one characteristic of all these people is they're all willing to pay more for things that they really love. And um, I mean, I, personally, I'm the same way. And, and you also notice that they delight in telling you about their products. They're, they're basically evangelists for their products. Um, and they'll go out and sell it for you. So, if you do make a deliciously good product, you will have evangelists. You have a free sales force, basically, that sells it for you. And so, uh, and this is where we'd like to get to here at Colleycom. Uh, as it turns out, on all these deliciously good products, uh, there's a Carnegie Mellon study that said that that uh, people buy they'll buy a warranty for something they consider fun, like an iPod or or, or some fun device. They won't buy one for something like a printer because it's a utilitarian and they don't they don't get involved with it every day. Um, but Consumer Reports, on the other hand, says don't buy the extended warranties because most of the time most things will last you know past you know past the past past the normal warranty and by the time it's broken you've paid so much in the extended warranty that you could have just had it fixed for, for less or bought a new product so that was kind of interesting and so since we all work at polycom where do we fit in or how does, what does polycom have to do with any of this so, so we would like to apply flow and finesse in the design of our products, in all aspects of design, from software to hardware to uh, industrial design. We want, we want our customers to be evangelists. <coughs> and we want our customers to pay more, which is why we're here. We're not a not-for-profit organization. We're here to make money. As it turns out, when we have visitors here in Austin, we have visitors from, like in the state of Texas, there are these... Uh, these uh, districts, these large districts called regions in education. There's a region 13 that comes by to visit us every six months or so and they tell, they'll come by and tell us their stories. And one of their stories is they love Polycom, they love to buy Polycom, they want to buy Polycom products, they want to be evangelists. So when we screw up, when we make a product that's not quite there, they're very disappointed. Not because we didn't make the right thing, they're disappointed we didn't make the right thing so that they can't tell their other colleagues that to buy Polycom because the other colleagues will have arguments, well, this isn't as good. They want to be able to say to their colleagues, uh, yes, uh, the Polycom such and such is the best thing out there. And so, uh, I mean, they love us, they, they like us, and they, and but they want us to make the right thing. Same thing with the federal government. When they come to visit us here, they say exactly the same thing. They'll continue buying from us, even if we make a little a mistake here or there. They want to continue buying from us, but they also, ultimately, they want us to make the right thing that's competitive. Um, so, the principles of flow and finesse can be applied everywhere, from documentation to power cords to workflows. You know, everything you do at Polycom, sales order, you know, if you if you sort the mail to do the industrial design to program the the, the SIP code, um, that can all be benefited by applying finesse and flow to your techniques. So think about it after you leave here about how you can apply them. And, um, Here's an example of where we fall short. So, so Polycom has fantastic products. I'm looking at an Eagle Eye camera right now, and it's deliciously beautiful. It's very pretty. It's beautiful, architecturally nice, design-wise, and the lines. It's clean. Gives a great picture. It looks absolutely beautiful. Our our hardware, as well, looks looks uh, artistically and and uh, mechanically and electronically fantastic. Love our individual products, but. Here, here's here's an example of where it doesn't work so well. So here's a case where we make these media cards, and they're very nice, very beautiful, have excellent audio. 
when they're working nice. And we also make deliciously nice codecs, beautiful codecs that work fantastically well and very, they're very competitive. But when we take these two systems and we put them together, so you take the Kodak and now you put it inside of the media card, what happens is the flow is not as smooth as, you, as you'd like. When you combine the two products, which remote do you use to turn on the system? Is the first monitor turned on? Is the second monitor turned on? Do I need to use the remote for the monitors to turn on the monitors? Is the remote for the Kodak turn on the Kodak? And which volume control do I use over here? Are both monitors on? How do I know that? When I turn on the Kodak, is, do the monitors turn on? When I turn it off, do the monitors turn off? Which volume does the volume control? Do I need to mess with the volume control on the monitors? There's too many ifs because the systems are not designed together. We design them separately. There's a group that designs, here's the rollabout, here's the immediate cart, and here's the Kodak. There's not a group that says, let's design a media cart Kodak combination together. So that when you turn on the Kodak, the monitors comes off. When the Kodak goes to sleep, the monitors go to sleep. Okay? So and and some and we have that problem elsewhere. Um, if I want to if I want to place if I want to do a recording with Polycom, this meeting is being recorded because Philip Hillbreath, I think he's recording, I don't know, but I think he's there, but he's done all the magic and we don't have to do anything and We'll get a link and they'll say this is where the recording is. However, if I want to record in my office or in a conference room, I'll take the remote in my hand, I'll press some keys and I'll call this thing called an RSS. Then I'll use the remote control to generate tones. And if I press the 2, that means go up on the menus on the RSS. If I press 8, that means go down. I don't know how I know this, but... and. So ultimately, I'm using my hand to hold the remote, to press the buttons, to send the tones, to set the RSS to record. So I'm several dimensions away from what I want to do. Now really, all I want to do is record. And there's a product in the, it's sold in the U.S. called a TiVo. A TiVo is a digital video recorder. It's the most popular one. It's, the, it's known as the, as the best one with the friendliest interface. All you have to do is pick up the remote and press record, and you're recording. Okay, that's where we want to get to. But the flow is... That's the flow. That's what I expect. I don't expect to have to do all these other uh, permutations and functions uh, in between uh, to, to record. So, so we want to go from UI in the third or fourth dimension, meaning UI very far removed from what I'm trying to do to the UI that I'm actually trying to do. So here's an example. How do we get there? This is the normal user experience. It's dark in here. I got to turn on the light. So I take my finger. I turn on the light. Everybody does that. So that's I'm a little bit removed, but everybody knows how to turn on the light. The enhanced user experience looks like this. I take my hand, I grab a tool. I use the tool to flip the switch, flip the switch, bring electricity to the light bulb, the light lights. Now the Uber enhanced user experience. This is now we're now going into the fourth dimension here. I take my hand, I grab the pipe wrench. I hold the screwdriver with the pipe wrench. I use the screwdriver to turn on the light. So I'm quite removed from what the thing that I'm trying to do here. I'm using a tool to use a tool to use a tool to get to where I want to do. But really what I want to do the desired user experience is something like this. Where, wouldn't it be nice if I could just touch the light to turn it on? Because that's what I'm trying to do. My user interface is my finger. My brain tells my finger to, that I want to turn on the light. And I'm, if I touch the light, that's what I want to happen. I don't want to be so many degrees away from what I'm trying to do. And oftentimes, in, in interfaces, you are too far removed from what you want to do, from either from placing the call or from recording or any action that you want to do. You want to be, it wants to be the action at hand. Now, now we are doing something nice in that we're, you know, I think that the world is moving probably because of, you know, this has a lot of influence. This, the iPhone has a lot of influence in that everybody's going to touch screens. And also, touch screens are getting cheaper. And when we go to touch screens, you are close. And so, how do we light the future? How does Polycom go from here? This is where, where do we want to go from here? We want to get to the point to when the room is dark. We go in the room and we think it's dark in here. 
and the room just lights. So when I walk into one of Polycom's rooms, it already knows that I have a meeting. Turn on the light, turn on the system, call the place where I want to call. You know who I am because I'm in the meeting because I've just, you can recognize my face, you can recognize the other participants. You know what my presentation is because it's already on the invite. You know what I'm going to talk about. You know where I'm calling, you know who's participating. You can do everything for me. You know when I turn on the light, you know when I turn off the light. You know when the room's asleep, you know when people are talking, you know when people are not talking. So we know a whole lot of information about the room. So let's move forward toward an experience with flow and finesse where you don't have to do very much. And all the actions in between are done for you. So I guess I would like for you all to leave here thinking about finesse and flow and how it applies to what you do every day. And just improve it 2%. Just go back to your desk and say, in the next six months, can I improve the flow and finesse of what I'm doing by 2%? If everybody in the company does it, and we have 2,600 employees, that's a lot of improvement. That's all we need to do to get to the no user, user experience. Thank you. Austin or, or elsewhere. How is, how, is this, how is this discussion being fed into the product planning and roadmap thinking for BSG? And, and then also, is there a way to extend that beyond BSG to uh, voice as well and even into PGS to make sure our products are more serviceable? And you know, so the flow of the whole process, because there are times when we have failures in the field, right? And, all the above, you know, so, uh, yeah, I remember at one point we had the serial number was on the bottom of the view station 4000s and the only time we, to be able to report even what product you had in problems was to take the thing out of the rack, right? Which is just a nightmare for customers, but that's what they had to do back five, six years ago. Is there is there a process in place to start this dialogue on a, on a broader basis? Okay, so uh, John would like to know, is there a process to start this dialogue on a broader basis uh, throughout the whole company. And how's this talk being uh, fed into product planning? Well, the only way I know to feed it into product planning is to do it right now, right here, and it's being fed to you. So you guys take it from here. I mean, us guys, I mean, I include myself. Just take it from here and go with it. I, I don't know of another way. We don't have a process uh, for this. Uh, the CTO gives these talks to inform, and then hopefully these talks have an effect on the rest of us in the company, like yourself. Can, can you forward this presentation? Yes, I can forward this presentation. Or you can the link to this. This, this presentation is, yeah. is not going to, I think it's being recorded. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, Philip, are you are you there? I don't know if he was, uh, no he's not. Okay, so um, maybe it's not being recorded, but, but we'll figure out a way right. to, to get it to you. Thank you. Um, is there a connection between audio Good question. The, the question is, is there a connection between audio group, uh, the VSG, and, and the voice guys? I think there's some very thin connections, but there's not the intimate connection that we'd like. Because I think that they they make some video products and we make some audio products and never the twins shall meet. I believe that um, I once, I, uh, a while back I took, I went to our web page and I took, I, I pasted all our products into a PowerPoint, kind of in a circle. Uh, on the outside, I had all the endpoint products, everything, every voice product and every video product. And on the inside, I had all the infrastructure products. And I counted, um, I think at the time, there was something like over 30, 35, 30, 35 products and 15 user interfaces. And uh, some were within VSG and some were VSG to, to voice division. And so there is that disparity. We don't, uh, we're not as intimately hooked up as we'd like to be. But as Bob Haggerty said when he was here uh, last week, he, he did say that, the, that, that these things need to operate similarly. So basically yeah. what you're saying is how well your products work together is proportional to how well your people work together. I would, I would say that's true. Yes. I mean, in my mind, we have this, we have smart people just like Apple does, just like Microsoft. We have just as smart or smarter people than they do. All we need to do is we just need to do it. There's no, there's nothing preventing us from doing it. 
And and if you're expecting management to come say, please, you know, can you do this? Can you can you work this way? Can you add a little finesse here? I, I don't think they'll. It's better coming from from us, from us right now first, and and see if you, rather than than down. Um, it'll be faster. So. Um, any questions from afar? Okay. Thank you. And, I, and for those of you who are here, I've got some gadgets, some of my favorite gadgets here uh, on the table if you want. Thank you very much. Tell me by Apple. Oh. I want to see you, Rep. Did you walk it?